Bartho, and welcome to the Atlanta History Center's Virtual Author Talk Series. I'm Virginia Prescott, host of GPB's On Second Thought, and your host for these talks. And tonight I'm speaking with Betty Kearse about her new book, The Other Madisons, The Lost History of a President's Black Family. You can purchase the book directly from Acapella Books. There's a link in the chat box to the right of your screen, and there's also a link provided on the Atlanta History Center website. As Betty and I are talking, we do invite you to your questions in the Q&A of your screen, and I will try to get to them, as many of them, as time allows. Dr. Betty Kearse is a retired physician and geneticist and Pushcart Prize-nominated essayist. The Other Madisons is her first book, and it follows a nearly 30-year quest to confirm her lineage. Kirkus Reviews called it Roots for a New Generation. Betty Kearse, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, I'm very happy to be part of this program. Well, most of us grew up thinking of James Madison as the fourth president, one of the founders of our country, wrote the first drafts of the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. What did you think or what were you told about him growing up? Well, I was told um, mostly what everybody else was. As you said, um, he was an important figure in um, American history. But I was also told that he was my great, 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 great grandfather uh, through his relationship with one of his enslaved cooks, whose name was Corain. So I was told that he was my ancestor. <laughs> And, and, and reminded of this, always remember, you're a Madison. You come from African slaves and a president. What did that mean to you as a child? Well, to me, it, it set some clear expectations. Um, it was intended to be a source of inspiration. Um, you know, I was reminded that I have this great man in um, my family history and that also I had slaves in my family who were to be as admired as well. And so there was a lot to live up to. A lot was expected of me. Hmm. And your mother, she carried the stories of your lineage told to her by her father from his Mac father and before both had been enslaved. Eight generations going back to the African woman who was kidnapped from her home country and brought to the United States. But this is the tradition of the griot or the griots in the feminine. Tell us a little bit about that tradition and its role in your family. Well, the, the tradition goes back thousands of years, probably before the birth of Christ. And um, the griots, are men and the griots are women who maintain entire cultures and the history of those cultures with its values um, for, you know, forever. I mean, <laughs> um, and I, I'm sure it's still going on today, but primarily it's an, a tradition of oral history. So this oral tradition carried on throughout your family and your mother she told the story to some others there was a slide presentation that she gave to historical and genealogical organizations in the 1980s you and your brothers called it the black madison's lecture circuit right. she in effect <laughs> handed this role to you of griot off when she gave you the box as you call it in the book what was in the box in the box were just all kinds of things. There were birth certificates, death certificates, marriage licenses, lots and lots of photographs, sample of my great aunt's amazing uh, hand stitching with old fashioned hand smocking. I don't know if you know what that is being so young, but it's um, a, a very fancy um, sort of way of embellishing uh, primary clothing for little girls. Um, there were, um, there's a slave census, there was, um, newspaper articles, just anything that could be gathered up and put together. And I, I, I neglected to say letters because those letters are very important, mm -hmm. uh, letters between family members. So what did it mean for you to receive this box? 
the wall was um, a big responsibility. For some, my mother hadn't warned me, I am gonna use that word, warned me that this was someday gonna be uh, my responsibility to take care of this box and its contents and to be the one responsible for making sure the stories um, didn't die and were you know, passed on through, through the generations. So at first I was um, just sort of overwhelmed mm -hmm. and not sure really how I should um, handle it. So I'm just gonna tell you one little story that sort of contributes to my concern. And that is that um, my mother is the one that actually created the box. Mm -hmm. Before that time, my grandfather and my great grandfather kept their documents and whatever they could find inside a family Bible. But my grandfather lost it during a move from one small Texas town to another, and he was absolutely devastated. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if I should try to make sure that didn't happen again, keep the, the, these items safe and put them away, and or should I, you know, tell these stories to as many people who were interested. Um, I decided on the latter because there were so many important things in there. The stories around those things were so important. Um, they, didn't ju they weren't just my family's stories. They were stories of enslaved people and their descendants. Um, and these people represented other African Americans. And there was just a message of, of strength and persistence and love that I thought it was important to share. Yeah. I want to hear a little bit more about you. You spoke of a sense of ambivalence and this set you on this path of discovery, many, many miles covered, many obstacles and a lot of emotional freight, let's say. Your mother, she had a kind of reverence for the Madison family. They, they gave her pride and meaning and strength for what for mm -hmm. her had been a really hard life. I'd love to hear some of your feelings about that, what it meant for you, because you had more ambivalence about being connected to this family. I, I did. Um, I'm a product of the 60s. So I sort of came of age, or reached woman, let me put it that way, um, during the civil rights movement, the Black Power movement, and very importantly, the, the women's um, movement. And so I felt licensed to sort of take on some of the more uncomfortable sides and really not try to hide them, you know, try to talk about them head on, which was very different from the way my mother looked at it. She was very, um, proud of being a descendant of President Madison, I think in some way reassured, in some way comforted by having something special in her family background um, that you know, set her apart from those who were experiencing the really difficult parts of being Black in America. Right, and she. I came along ready to, you know, punch it in the face. <laughs> she grew up, however, during Jim Crow, very strict mother. Yes. Um, and and uh, just to reiterate that people, if they have questions for Dr. Kears, you can ask them in the Q and A. You can just type them into the Q and A section. It's on the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to them. Uh, but this, in, I want to, uh, you were alluding to hitting these things head on. And this all does begin with Mandy, this woman kidnapped from Africa as a teenager, purchased by James Madison Sr. He sexually assaulted her. She bore his child, Corrine was her name. And James Jr., the man who became president, raped Corrine, who bore his child. So this is not only rape, but there's incest in there too. And, and yeah. your mother... Ruby was really rude to call it rape and courageous of you to have that conversation with her head on about what that means. Can, can you talk a little bit about that conversation with her? 
Well, I, re I remember this uh, pretty well. Unfortunately, I was uh, sitting on the floor of my bedroom with a bunch of papers around me when I happened to decide to call her because I was thinking, did she, I mean, did she really recognize what this was? So I called her up and I said, do you know that President Madison and his father's were rapists? And she said, really? And I said, yes, you know, that that's what they were. And so she was quite uncomfortable with that term. And um, her term that, that she preferred was visiting. Hmm. What do you think that meant for her to, to frame it like that? To call it visiting? Yes. Or to listen to me well, yeah, either. I'm, I'm interested in that dynamic because I think this is such a part of what you confronted. It wasn't just not being able to find historical records, but it was your own family, the history that they had carried with them. And in a way, you were, you were, you know, you were batting at a sacred cow. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was the first to um, take up the bat, mm -hmm. um, you know, not just my mother, but my, my grandfather, who actually passed down the stories to her, always used the term visiting and never explained to her what it meant. And when my mother would go to someone else, like his sister, my aunt Laura, they were very uncomfortable um, with, you know, talking about what had actually happened in a straightforward way. And, you know, just refused to talk about it. you are angry if, um, approached um, with, you know, with those kinds of questions. Well, so you, however, were going to get at the unvarnished truth about the parts of the saga that had, I guess, gone unchallenged. Um, the official history, of course, is that James Madison did not have any children with his wife, the famous hostess Dolly Madison. She was a widow and had a son when they married. But you, the story your family told for generations details parts of their life and the life of James and Corrine's son, Jim, who was sold off as a teenager at Dolly's urging. Can you, um, you know, give us a little recap? Of course, it's complicated and it's a life we're talking about, but a sense of what you heard about his life. About Jim's life? Or, yes. or... Jim's life, I'm interested in that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um... Jim was Madison and Corrine's son. And um, about the time he was born, one of Dolly's nieces came to live uh, with them at, at uh, Montpelier. And uh, Dolly assigned Corrine to be his wet nurse. And so um, the story goes that she put Jim, Kareem put Jim on one breast and the baby whose name was Victoria on the other breast and nursed him together. And over the years, they became very good friends. And when they were in their teens, they fell in love with each other. And Dolly found, found out about it and she promptly sold Jim and Jim ended up in Tennessee and he never saw his mother or his father or Victoria again. It's just a heartbreaking story and just one of many heartbreaking story. So, but you decided you were gonna try and find out, you were gonna try and find these unnamed, unrecorded, what happened to Jim. And in 1992, you made your first of many, many trips to Montpelier. This is the Madison family plantation. It's now an historic site traveled to Portugal, to Africa, to several states. And like so many people who are descended from slaves, whose lives weren't considered um, important enough, let's say, to document, a lot of trails went cold, but there were some real breakthrough moments for you. Do you would you care to share any of those? In terms of finding Jim? Well, in terms of whatever you discovered along the way. There are so many, you know, little gems as you're wandering through this, this maze to try and find more about your family. Well, it was certainly difficult because um, often names were not recorded. 
Um, often families were um, separated, sold apart, which is what happened to Jim. And um, I tried, but it was very difficult to find out who had purchased him, uh, where exactly he had gone. And the trail um, sort of picks up with his son, Emmanuel. So there is documentation of him. Doesn't have his name, but we know who he was because of who owned him. Mm -hmm. So he was owned by um, Jephthah Billingsley, who was uh, famous in, in Tennessee and famous later in Texas when, when they moved there. So we had hoped to trace back from Emmanuel to um, Jim, but we didn't quite do it. My, when I say we, I'm talking about me and my cousins. I have, well, one of my cousins passed. There was a, three of us who were doing research together. One of them unfortunately passed, but my cousin, Sean Harley, came across the, an 1830 slave census. I'm sorry, census, just an American census, because the man he found was not a slave. His name was Shadrach Madison. And for a number of reasons, we believe that Shadrach actually could have, have been Jim. Mm -hmm. So now that's, that's what um, I'm trying to do is to somehow, you know, verify that Shadrach was, was our Jim. You know, he was born in, in Virginia around the same time. Um, it, they lived in the same place. They were originally owned by the same family. Um, they had this unusual name, first name, Shadrach. And then when they were freed, they chose the name Madison. Mm -hmm. Which speaks to the remember, always remember you are a Madison. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, Katrina Williams says, Dr. Kears, thank you for writing this important book. What are your thoughts regarding those who are trying to rewrite the narrative around slavery, the attempts to portray slavery as indentured servitude or exclude from the school history book entirely? They're deniers. Um, you know, they're just, they, I guess in some ways, not unlike my aunt, Laura, who, you know, didn't want to talk about the painful parts. I mean, this is a painful part of American history. You know, it happened. It's a very important part because this country wouldn't have been what it is without the millions of slaves who, who did the work to make it what it is. Yeah, that's, it comes across so clearly in your book that the role of dependency on slavery, not just as an institution, but almost as a, uh, uh, you know, an emotional support that, uh, and userous support in other ways. And you, you went to Portugal, you researched the origins of the slave trade and the twisted moral code that was adopted to rationalize the business, which was very profitable, to Lagos, Nigeria, then to Ghana, the, 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 why take on these physical and emotional experiences? What, what did they add to your sense of the family story? For me, they helped me to understand who I am. I'm, I grew up in a very solid, middle-class, very protected environment. So I didn't have any idea of what my enslaved ancestors had gone through. And I just felt like I was missing part of myself. So I, I went look for them. I looked for Mandy and all the places that you name. I looked for Kareen at um, Montpelier. And I literally walked in her footsteps, which was just, um, just a profound experience. And, and in so doing, I got an inkling, just an inkling of what my ancestors had gone through and how they helped 
to their experience. It's how they helped shape me. And I learned a lot about their incredible strengths, their inner strengths, their sense of balance, their sense of hope, um, and of course the talents and values you know, that, that they have that they've passed down to all of them, their descendants. And this is true for every slave family, not just mine. Right. If you have questions for Dr. Kears, you can write them in the Q&A segment of your screen. It's down on the bottom of the screen. I'd be happy to get to as many as possible. Um, so you just threw yourself in all the way for, to, uh, to being the family griot and trying to understand the depravity and inhumanity that landed Mandy in the U.S. in these trips that you went on, but also to confirm the family lineage and the stories that you had heard not just through historic records, but also through DNA and enlisted the help of uh, Dr. Bruce Jackson. He said, Dr. Bruce, yes. Yeah. So you approached the National Society of Madison Family Descendants about authenticating, authenticating your family's DNA. Where did that lead you? Well, it looked like it was going to be very promising. Um, Dr. Jackson emphasized again and again be careful with the genealogy, because if you compare your DNA to the wrong person, they can say, oh, see, I told you, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not related. So the um, National Society of Madison Family Descendants did identify one man who had the appropriate um, genealogy and who initially was willing to participate in a comparative DNA study. But what happened was that shortly after that, there was a big article about my research in the Washington Post. And he just didn't want to get involved in the brouhaha. So he, he um, backed off. And so since then, I haven't um, really pursued that. And, you know, I've been feeling because, more yeah. and more that it's not that the DNA and the, you know, the proof that other, you know, um, non-African American families have to do. I began to feel that that's not really what's important. Yeah, I think that, that was fascinating. I know you've been asked many, many times, like, would it matter to you if you did get proof that you were descended from uh, James Madison or that you were not. And you came to a really interesting place with that. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Well, if I did get proof, it would be great for my book. Right, <laughs> but, exactly. You know, for the, you know, for the marketing, but it's, it's about much more than, than marketing. It's, it, as I was saying, it's really about um, understanding who you are and what you're values are and really, um, you know, honoring and respecting the slaves and knowing that you inherited a lot of their strengths and that you, you know, you have an opportunity to contribute um, just as much as they did, you know, to this country. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not about proof, it's about knowing who you are. Mm. Uh, let's see here, another question. Dr. Kears, do you have any sense of the role of faith or religion, of, I'm sorry, what faith or religion played in the life of your slave ancestors who must have been very strong people inside and out? How, if at all, has the faith informed your own view of life? Well, um, my enslaved ancestors uh, were strong Christians as most uh, slaves were, it, you know, it helped form a sense of communi community. Um, it was an important component to our values and uh, those beliefs were passed down to all of us and including myself. You know, it's a, an important part of, of my daily life and my daily sense of who I am. Another question here, Dr. Kears, thank you for sharing your family story. Have you been in contact with other enslaved families of our founding fathers? Of course, yes. uh, famously the Sally Hemings family uh, yes. of the descendants. Tell me more about that. What, what's yes, yes. 
Um, on two occasions, actually. One was um, at the University of Virginia. Um, I'm going to say maybe three years ago. I can't remember exactly. But there was um, a symposium on slavery in the university. In the university. And um, so there, I was on a panel discussion with descendants of James Monroe and um, um, Thomas Jefferson and descendants of slaves who had worked at the university, some of whom were owned by the university. And then later, just last year, I was at Montpelier and I was on an, another panel with descendants of those, um, well, the, the, see at that one, it was descendants of Monroe, Jefferson, and Washington. So yes, I have, I have met them and stayed in contact. Well, you built so many relationships in this journey, um, several with the people who work at Montpelier for one yes. thing, but many, many others. But we're talking about, you know, this is the most elite of elite Americans. That he's called the father of the Constitution, student of the Enlightenment, and preserving the sacred fire of liberty, which is at the very foundation of America's national ethos. And yet this is also the man who came up with the political compromise to count enslaved Africans as three-fifths human. You, you, you do so much to flesh out the people that are in your slave descendant line. How do you make sense of these contradictions in James Madison? Or, you know, my other question, I guess, could be, does it even matter who he was? Does it matter who he was? Um, that's a, that's really a, a, a good question and a tough one. I mean, I, I think it does matter. Um, you know, with, it's hard to balance out his, his faults with his strengths. Mm -hmm. um, it would be great if, if he had freed slaves and had lived up to his ideals, but he didn't. He didn't free a single slave. Um, not I, I think because he couldn't. After his uh, George Washington. Right, right. Oh, sorry, I cut you off. You said he no, could Well, George Washington freed, freed those slaves who were, in fact, his own. Um, he, was, he did not uh, free his wife's slaves, but he did free some from slaves. And Thomas Jefferson freed slaves who were probably his direct descendants. Mm -hmm. But James Madison didn't free a single slave. The closest he came to that um, was his slave, Billy, who went with him to Philadelphia mm -hmm. and whose contract Madison sold to um, a northerner, knowing that eventually, or assuming anyway, that eventually he would be uh, freed and, and and he was freed, but Madison himself did not free him. So he, you know, he, You're what, like Jefferson and all of them, they, they lived this um, kind of strange dichotomy of having all these um, lofty ideals, wonderful ideals, but not truly being able to live up to them. I think, you know, they probably said, well, that's, you know, that's the way we do things here. And, you know, didn't really want to um, flesh out the wrong in it. They knew what was wrong, but as far as acting on it, it was very hard for them to do. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. What positive or negative reactions have you received from your book? Well, so far, <laughs> I've only had positive reactions. Yeah. I'm guessing, you know, there's probably going to be some controversy here. There are still people who are disputing the account and the DNA tests for uh, Sally Hemings family. Right, right. Um, 
Well, you, I was mentioned building relationships at Montpelier, and you you mentioned speaking at workshops and symposia there, re-examining historical narratives and how they're formed and who is included. There is a, a, a real history movement that wants to contextualize how we remember, um, whether it is integrating that story of Sally Hemings at Monticello or here in uh, Georgia, the Atlanta History Center has actually been active in contextualizing lost cause Civil War monuments. How do you think, how would you like your family story to be reflected at Montpelier? Well, Montpelier, the first time I went to Montpelier was in 1992. And this was six years before the DNA proof that the Hemings family had. So they were ahead of the game already because they were, the, the day that I arrived, the first time, I was able to see an excavation site, which was um, a, a, a kitchen, the South Kitchen. And they were looking for the truth. They were trying to learn who the slaves were, what they did, how they pay, played a role in James Madison's life and at Montpelier and what their contributions were to the country. They were already doing that. And they have, have continued to do that. My relationship with them, and they're, they're my friends. They have always been supportive and um, really interested in my story because they want the whole story. And um, one of my aunts, Corrine's name is up on the wall. Uh, where other slaves are listed. And I was involved in the permanent exhibit that's called A Mere Distinction of Color, which is a quote from James Madison. And that exhibit is something I feel all Americans should see because it puts, um, it puts the role of slaves in perspective. It, it talks about their role in at Montpelier, um, how they were dealt with in the Constitution, the fact that they were people and not just commodities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like to say that there were millions of slaves, but there were millions of individuals. And um, the exhibit at Montpelier encourages you to see that. What does that mean to have that fuller, more inclusive picture of American history? It's the whole story. <laughs> it's the real story. It's, it's the voices um, that weren't heard. It, um, African slaves weren't really able to speak for themselves, but they left their mark everywhere. From New York City, they built a wall all over the country, in Boston and everywhere I've lived, there's the, the mark of the slaves is there. Question from Jen P. Uh, the story of your family is amazing and I love the book. Your message of what it's like to be Black in America is, what would you like people and women in particular to take away from your story? Women, is it women in particular? Mm -hmm. the, to, what would you like people and women in particular to take away from your story? Well, you know, when I, as I was writing this book, I kind of imagined that Black women reading this book and, um, you know, seeing that, you know, slaves were, were strong, that they had the same strengths too. And I hope that they would pass down those um, same qualities. They would tell their own children about those qualities. But th there's a chapter in the book that's called Visiting. And that's the chapter that's about rape. And one specific message I wanted to convey was that rape was, 
it was, a, a, it could happen in any setting. And one setting was within marriage. So I, I did want to portray that to all women that, you know, um, marriage didn't necessarily offer a haven from the possibility of um, being sexually abused. Yeah, and there's a lot there for readers to, to dig into about, you know, the sexualization of, of African-American women, which I think is yeah. really rich. That's a tough chapter because, <laughs> yeah. you know, little girls growing up, um, there was a likelihood that they could be raped and there was nothing that their mothers could do about it. Here's a question uh, uh, from Charlotte. Uh, when I think of the racial divide that pers persists down all these centuries, I sometimes wonder if the interconnectedness of families can be part of the healing. I don't want to, of course, suggest that the abuse and taking of vulnerable women as sex partners should be celebrated, but I wonder if the denial of common humanity that is even now shockingly present among us can be subverted by descendants coming together as a family. Your thoughts? That was a long question. It was a long question. <laughs> really good question. The, the, a, yes. I'm sorry uh, to say that it disappears, so I can't reread it. Oh, oh. But okay, I think so, I can remember it. The interconnectedness as part of the healing, you know, instead of the dividing of the way that we think of history or the divide, the binary way. I hope I'm not putting words in her mouth. It was in families? I'm, it came back up. Oh, the, miracle, the miracle of the moderators, it came back up. Okay, okay. When I think of the divide that persists, this down all these sometimes wonder if the interconnectedness of families can be part of the healing. I don't, of course, suggest that the abuse and taking of vulnerable women as sex partners should be celebrated, but wonder if the denial of common humanity that is even now shockingly present among us can be subverted by descendants coming together as a family. It's a terrific question. Well, yes. Um, it'll, it'll take work and outreach. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting um, a good, Connie Graft. She was a, a great person. She's a descendant of, of one of Madison's um, sisters. And she um, has shared with me that she's glad she's my cousin. Um, she views the history the same way and you know she believes that uh, we should all come together and look at the whole truth of, of our family backgrounds and um, you know recognize the, the healing that coming together will definitely bring. Another question, Tony asked, do you feel, how do you feel about President Madison now, any different than before your research? Um, I'm allowing myself to be angry with him. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's only different in that I have clarity on that. Because he, he knew it was wrong and um, he, yet he used one of his enslaved women. The other thing, what he didn't do was he didn't prevent Dolly from selling Jim. So I, I lost that connection to an ancestor that, you know, I want to know. So yeah, I'm, I'm allowing myself to be um, disappointed in him as well. Well, we have to close that there are so many stories that people can look forward to, uh, you know, uh, one of a slave poisoning his master, not being killed, of the grit and fortitude it took for newly emancipated slaves to establish themselves, your great grandfather Max role in an armed riot in Cedar Creek in 1889 over the right to vote, and of course, so much more about the journey that you go on to find all of those things out. 
I'm wondering, Dr. Pierce, you know, before we close, there were so many names left out of the official records of your family, names that you just want to put out there and share with us tonight, all the people listening. Well, the first name I want to put out is Mandy. Mandy was a first family griot and our first, my family's first African ancestor in America. We've talked about Kareem. We've talked about Jim. Um, we've mentioned uh, Emmanuel, who was one of Jim's um, sons. Emmanuel married Elizabeth, and then they had a ton of children. <laughs> um, and eight of they were fortunate, most of them were able to stay together. There was some who either died or sold off. But in that, in that family, in that generation, there's my um, great grandfather, Mac, and then it's his brother, Shelby, and Giles, and Young, and James, and John, and I could go on and, and name all, all eight of them. And then there was my Gramps, um, you know, um, my beloved grandfather, and then, you know, my, the rest of them. <laughs> well, thank you so Wonderful much. Wonderful family. Wonderful family. Yeah. So appreciate you sharing part of that story with us tonight. And we just got a lovely note from Connie Graft, who uh, you just mentioned. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking, I hope Connie's not mad at me for throwing out her name. She is not. She says, this is a real story and I'm proud to be Betty's cousin. I would love to see Betty and other Madison descendants and I, she counts herself, and other Madison descendants to come together and Montpelier and talk about our histories. She said, I will never be mad at you. Oh, good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so all is resolved in that part of the world anyway. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Betty Pierce, for joining us tonight. A real pleasure. Oh, thank you for having me. This is great. And we thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We're going to be airing an edited version of this talk with Dr. Pierce on Second Thought on Friday, May the 5th. 50. Next up in the virtual author series, author talk series, Mary Beth Keen about her new novel, Ask Again, Yes. That's going to be on Tuesday, May the 12th. And Stephanie Danler on May 21st to talk about her new memoir. It's called Stray. You can see a full video and watch video of our other virtual author events at atlantahistorycenter.com. Thank you again so much, Dr. Betty Kears. Really a pleasure. And thank you all for joining.